Hi, I'm Ben, and this is the house I built out of shipping containers. Now, I've been interested in shipping container architecture for quite some time, but I had a really hard time finding good information about how to get building permits or how much would it cost. Well, we did the research, we documented everything that we did, and now we're so excited to share with you what we learned. So check it out. In this episode, we're going to go over how we painted the containers and anchored them to the concrete foundation slabs. Let's start with what we did to prepare for the paint. After installing the doors and windows, we used fire blocking spray foam to seal the gaps between the windows and doors and the steel frames that reinforce the cuts in the containers. The reason we use fire blocking foam is so that it won't be damaged by the welding. We then welded on trim pieces to cover this insulation. For the first few doors, we installed the steel frames first and then ground away the mill scale to prepare them for primer. If I was to do this again, I would have done this preparation prior to actually installing the frames. It would just be a little bit easier to grind away everything. I used a combination of sanding sponges and the angle grinder to clean the steel. I then wiped down the frames with mineral spirits to remove any grease or dust that might be on them. I decided to try two different primers to see if they would hold up differently over time. First I tried Rust-Oleum Self-Etching Primer. This primer calls for the steel to be clean and rust free, so I spent a lot more time on preparation. For the other frames I used a much easier to apply Rusty Metal Primer and I spent less time on prep. I just wire brushed away any obvious rust with an angle grinder and then wiped the frames down with mineral spirits before applying. The Rusty Metal Primer was way easier so for the remaining doors I pre prime them before installing them. I did have to grind away a bit of primer in order to weld them into place though. Once the primer was dry, I sealed the cracks with GE paintable silicone. I've had really good experiences with GE sealants and this is also the product that my painter recommended. Now the single bead of silicone isn't the only thing keeping the water out. If you go back to episode 3, you'll see how I used angle steel to create an overlap that will protect me even if this silicone should fail. I probably over applied the caulk, but I knew it would be fine once I was done painting. While I was working on the doors and windows, Tony started sealing up the roof vents. We need soil stacks to vent the areas that have plumbing, and after spray foaming the joints from both the inside and out, Tony screwed down some flashing over the pipes. He very generously applied silicone caulk and he had to bend the flashing to get it to fit the ribs of the ceiling panels. Once the silicone had cured, he cleaned the areas and then sprayed everything with Henry Stop Leak Roofing Spray. This spray foams up and creates a thick waterproof coating. Even though I DIY most things, there are some tasks where I prefer a hybrid approach and feel that hiring professionals is definitely worth the time and money. Exterior painting is one of those tasks. Howard's brother Henry is a painter and he got started on priming the hardware on the doors and taping off the windows. For the exterior paint, I went to Home Depot and picked up some PPG Timeless Exterior Paint in a color called elegant charcoal. I selected the flat slash matte option and I'm super happy with the color and durability so far over a year later. I'm really glad we hired Henry. It only took him one day to do each coat and he did such a great job spraying even consistent coats that fully coated every detail on the containers. He also knew exactly what to tape off and didn't spend too much time prepping because he knew he was really accurate since he had a lot of experience with his own sprayer. For the inside, we also use PPG paint, but this time in a color called Crystal Clear White. And once again, we went with a flat finish. I love how this color of gray takes on different characteristics depending on the exterior light. Aesthetically, this home rivals any of the high-end architecture projects that I did with my firm, but we did it all with things that are available from Home Depot. So consider PPG paints for your next project because I highly recommend them. Now before we get to how we secured the containers to the foundation slab, let me tell you a little bit about the sponsor for this video, Simply Safe. Simply Safe is an easy to use, customizable home security system that is free from contracts and hidden costs. I got my system in the mail and I was really impressed with not only how many different types of security and home monitoring devices they provided, but also with how easy they all were to install. But what's more important than ease of installation is the fact that Simply Safe protects you like a pro. With 24 7 professional monitoring with a 3.5 times faster police dispatch rate. When there is a break in, Simply Safe's alarm received the highest priority police dispatch because their security specialists provide real eyewitness evidence 
to the police department. The Simply Safe specialist can notify police if an intruder is in the house, if they are armed, and what they are doing, which results in 3.5 times faster dispatches. Simply Safe is a modern and comprehensive system that protects your home both inside and out. Outside, the video doorbell and HD cameras alert you to anyone approaching your home, and smart locks and entry sensors guard the perimeter. Inside, a layer of motion and glass break sensors plus privacy protecting cameras provide another layer of protection. Simply Safe is the number one expert recommended home security system, and The Verge says it's the best home security system, period. I like that they have fair and honest prices with no contracts whatsoever. One of my favorite features is the Simply Safe lock. It only took me about 15 minutes to install this, and it makes my home more secure by ensuring that it's always locked. The majority of break ins are people entering through unlocked entry points, and so the Simply Safe lock is designed so that you can make sure your door is locked even when you forget to do it yourself. It can also keep track of who comes and goes and you can grant access from anywhere to guests and visitors which is really great because sometimes I like to Airbnb the container house. So go to simplysafe.com slash modern home to learn more. That's simplysafe.com slash modern home to better protect yourself, your home, and your family. All right, back to the build. Once the paint had cured, I used spray foam to close up the space between the containers and the concrete slabs. The blocks at the corners of the containers hit the concrete, but everything else floats about one quarter of an inch above it. This foam will provide backing for the grout that I will apply next. The foam expanded out of the crack and I just used a knife to cut away the excess. We mixed up a batch of Quitcrete Precision Grout and then pushed it into the crack all the way up against the foam. I generously applied the grout using a really wide putty knife. I used this handy masonry tool to get a nice finish on the grout and the detail ended up looking nice and clean. I scraped away the excess and then used a sponge to clean everything up. Now this isn't just to give it a nice finished look, this is also critical for keeping out little critters and varmints from hiding out underneath the container. Structurally, we were required to anchor the containers to the concrete slab foundations. We looked at several options before electing to use a combination of heavy duty angle steel, steel plates, and threaded rod. One of the main reasons to secure the containers to the slab is to prevent movement during an earthquake that could shear the plumbing and electric connections. I measured the locations for the holes and then used my drill press to drill one inch diameter holes in the steel. These sections are three quarters of an inch thick and this took a while. We went through about three different drill bits to do all 72 holes. These heavy pieces of steel will be welded to the corner blocks on the containers and then threaded rod will be inserted in the holes and into the concrete where an anchoring epoxy will secure them. I ground away a little bit of paint and some rust to prepare these pieces for welding. The building department required that I use a structurally certified welder to perform these specific tasks. So I hired a local welder named Don and he tack welded the plate to the long angle and then check the fit before welding the entire seam. He did all of this with a stick welder and then he used a torch to cut off the excess. While Don welded the rest of the pieces, I started prepping and priming the ones that were already done. I used some blue tape to keep the top parts clear of paint and then sprayed the steel with two coats of Rust-Oleum Rusty Metal Primer. I placed the steel pieces and then marked the hole locations on the concrete with a Sharpie, and then used my Milwaukee hammer drill to drill one and a quarter inch diameter holes one foot deep into the concrete. This is a really incredible piece of equipment and I was super impressed with how fast it drilled through solid concrete. I typically use all Ryobi tools, but I do make exceptions for large industrial tools like this. I checked to make sure that the steel rods fit, and then I painted the steel with a roller. I squirted in some Quickcrete high strength anchoring epoxy into the holes, and then placed the steel and used a mallet to drive in the threaded rods. This two-part epoxy gets mixed together in the nozzle and is incredibly strong. It has a compressive yield strength of over 10,000 PSI, 
and its pull-out strength is 28,000 pounds of force. It's a pretty strong pull-out game, if you ask me. Once the epoxy had cured, Don came back and welded the steel angles to the corner boxes on the containers. Now this seemed to be the best option to us at the time, but let's go over to the studio and discuss our other options. So let's talk about anchoring containers to concrete slabs. Now, obviously, these are some pretty heavy duty chunks of steel and they weren't the easiest things to work with. So of course we look for a different alternative first. Now originally, our structural engineer suggested using something like these. These are called bridge clamps and they suggested using a slightly different variation of this where this clamp part could slide freely and then you use a nut behind it on this really thick threaded rod to tighten it down. Now, that would have been a great solution, but there's two issues that we had with this. The specific bridge clamps that met this specification were about $350 each and we needed 12 of them. The other issue is that with this detail, we would have had to embed one foot of this type of rod into the concrete before we actually poured the slab. So that means we would have had to be pretty accurate with our measurements and our placement. And I just didn't want to have to have only one shot to get that perfect. This other solution involving this heavy duty three quarter inch thick angle steel certainly was cumbersome, but it wasn't too hard to do. And it was very flexible, even if we got the placement of the containers just a little bit off. Now I get a lot of comments about how this container house is totally overbuilt. And frankly, I totally get it. I have the same impression when I look at the details that are required, but it's really not about this sort of common sense approach. It's really about what you can prove through calculations and more importantly, getting a licensed engineer to stamp the drawings. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter how smart you think you are or how clever of a detail you have or how overbuilt you think something is, you simply can't build it unless you can prove it through calculations. That being said, I do want to hear your ideas, even the ones that might be a little bit out there, because I plan on building more of these shipping container houses and I'm willing to look for the engineers that will put the numbers behind it and actually stamp these kind of details so we can start publishing some options that are a little bit easier than what we did for this first one. So ideas and opinions are welcome, but false certainty is just a waste of time. If you say that you know for sure that you can do something or that it would hold, then prove it. Put your numbers where your mouth is or shut up. Because the one thing we don't need about shipping container houses is just more wild misinformation. This house is the first of many. I hope to improve all the details with each iteration. And I'll try to provide the best explanations I can for why I did things, even if they don't make sense on the surface. I'm also working on trying to get a interview with the engineers that worked on this project so you can actually hear from them why they picked the things that they did. Our next episodes are going to focus on building out the interiors, the kitchens and bathrooms and all that stuff. And then we'll conclude with a final house tour as well as an episode dedicated entirely to breaking down the budget. If you're interested in obtaining the PDF plans for this project, there's a link in the description box below. Just click that and it'll take you to Gumroad where we sell them. Thanks for watching and thanks to Simply Safe for sponsoring this video. Bye.